Hello and welcome. My name is Mikhail Sergeyev, and today we are going to talk about arguments for the existence of God in Abdul Baha's writings. The Baha'i faith is a monotheistic religion, and the notion of one supreme deity occupies the central place in Baha'i thought. On various occasions, Abdul Baha stressed the importance of formulating the rational proofs of God's existence. As Abdul Baha admonishes his audience during one of his public addresses, he says, I quote, Day and night you must strive that you may attain to the significance of heavenly kingdom, perceive the signs of divinity, acquire certainty of knowledge, and realize that this world has a creator, a vivifier, a provider, an architect, knowing this through proofs and evidence and not through susceptibilities, nay, rather through decisive arguments and real vision." Unquote. In many of his talks and writings, Abdu'l-Bahá points out that the essence and the nature of the Supreme Being are hidden from human cognition. The reality of the Godhead, he writes in one letter, I quote, is beyond the grasp of the mind. How could it be possible for a contingent reality, that is, man, to understand the nature of that pre-existing, pre-existent essence, the divine being? Man grasps his own illusory conceptions, but the reality of divinity can never be grasped. The, that divinity which man does imagine for himself exists only in his mind, not in truth. Since no one can ever have knowledge of God in himself, the only way for humans to acquire some understanding of divinity is to turn to the effects of God's work on the human plane, or, in other words, to prove the reality of God for others. I quote, The utmost one can say, Abdul Baha argues, is that the ultimate reality's existence can be proved, but the condition of its existence are unknown, unquote. And although the divine essence is unseen of the eye and the existence of the deity is intangible, he adds in another tablet, yet conclusive spiritual proofs assert the existence of that unseen reality. For instance, the nature of ether is unknown, but that it exists is certain by the effect it produces, heat, light, and electricity being the waves thereof. By these waves, the existence of ether is thus proven. And as we consider the outpourings of divine grace, we are assured of the existence of God." End quote. In this presentation, we are going to discuss in the historical philosophical context, the arguments for God's existence that Abdul Baha uses in his various writings and speeches. Philosophical reflections about divine reality originated already in antiquity. The Bible uh, preserves for us uh, perhaps the earliest examples of that. In the final book of the Torah, the Deuteronomy, Moses instructed his people how to distinguish false from true prophecies. He said, I quote, If a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, but the thing does not take place or prove true, it is a word that the Lord has not spoken." Unquote. In other words, Moses' argument was that God's existence should be inferred from the results of his actions that can be predicted by the prophets, the messengers of God's will in the human world. And if the outcomes of those actions, as well as the prophecies themselves, do not turn right, then the divine will had nothing to do with it. Classical Greek philosophers Plato and Aristotle developed the first known to us logical arguments for the existence of God. Both thinkers, I quote, Plato in Laws and Aristotle in Metaphysics, argued that the finitude or contingency of objects or events in the world could not provide adequate grounds for the world's coming into being. An endless chain of contingent or finite causes, they argue, remains implausible. Similarly, movement or change within the world points to a being who is changeless, or the ground of change, to a being who is necessary rather than contingent. 
end quote. In the Middle Ages, this approach was revived and expanded upon by a variety of arguments, not only within the Muslim and Christian religious traditions, but also in the Hindu philosophical speculation. In modern times, and especially in the 19th and 20th century, centuries, the debate over the existence of God took a new turn in light of most recent scientific developments in cosmology, biology, and human psychology. The basic typology of arguments for the existence of God can be traced back to the early fathers of the Christian Church. A second century Christian thinker, Clement of Alexandria, already distinguished between the arguments from the observation of nature and from the contemplation of the soul. The external cosmological proofs and the inner realization of the innate idea of God in one's soul, according to Clement, can only lead to the belief in God's existence, but not to the discovery of God's nature or to the meaning of divine actions. In modern philosophical terminology, these two types of arguments are called a priori internal proofs and a posteriori external proofs. The a priori proofs of the existence of God were also discussed in the early Christian theology. A second century Christian thinker, Athenagoras, was the first in the history of Christian thought to provide a philosophical argument for the existence of one God against the belief of, of pagan polytheism. Sometimes called topological, his argument points out that by the very definition God is limitless. If one admits the existence of more than one God, then those gods will limit each other, thus contradicting the basic premise of the argument. Hence, Athenagoras concludes, there must exist only one God. The classic formulation of the a priori proof, which is known in the history of philosophy as the ontological argument, belongs to the medieval Christian thinker, the Archbishop of Canterbury, St. Anselm. In his Proslogion, St. Anselm wrote, I quote, that God exists so truly that it cannot be thought not to exist. For it is possible to think that something exists that cannot be thought not to exist. And such a being is greater than one that can be thought not to exist. Therefore, if that than which a greater cannot be thought can be thought not to exist, then that than which a greater cannot be thought is not that than which a greater cannot be thought. And this is a contradiction. So uh, that than which a greater cannot be thought exists so truly that it cannot be thought not to exist. The father of German idealism, Immanuel Kant, proposed another version of the a priori argument in his case, from the freedom of human will. Kant rejected any proofs that were based on observation of the external world, since they rely on the nature of human experience that reflects the workings of the mind rather than the world as it actually is. Instead, he appealed to the moral imperative as a necessary precondition of God's existence because without the fear of divine retribution, humanity will lose its most vital incentive for good moral behavior. Kant's reference to morality is not, strictly speaking, a valid proof, but rather a postulate of practical reason that in no way, according to Kant himself, can be supported by the conclusions arrived at by theoretical reason. As a result, Kantian approach turns into a paradox for humanity to pursue moral virtues, God must exist, although we cannot prove that he does. <clears throat> 
The third argument from inner perception addresses human emotions, especially those associated with faith and religiosity. The feelings of reverence and love toward God, the fear of losing connection with divinity by the virtue of their very existence seem to prove the existence of the object of those feelings. An Anglo-Catholic thinker, Taylor, provided a modern restatement of the argument in his essay, The Vindication of Religion. He wrote here about the uniqueness of religious experience, I quote, it is universal voice of the mutable and temporal brought face to face with the absolutely eternal. As nearly as we can express our attitude towards that which awakens the sense of being immediately in the presence of the otherworldly by any one word, we may say that it is the attitude of worship." Unquote. This attitude of worship and the sense of the holy that are universally present in all human civilizations in Taylor's view, already represent a sufficient proof of the reality of God. In contrast to the a priori proofs, a posteriori arguments for the existence of God rely on the observation of the external world. The Holy Book of Islam, the Quran, for instance, I quote, teaches that God's revelation has occurred in several forms in nature, history, and scripture. Therefore, God's existence can be known through creation that contains pointers or signs of God, through the history of the rise and fall of nations that provide the lessons of God's sovereignty and intervention in history, and through a series of messengers." Unquote. In Islamic, Christian, and Jewish philosophy, one finds mostly the arguments from the nature of creation that lead to the conclusion of God's existence. The substance of the arguments goes back to Plato and Aristotle, who discuss motion and causality. This line of thought, which is known in the history of philosophy as the cosmological argument, received further development in the Middle Ages. Medieval Muslim thinkers Al-Kindi and Al-Ghazali, for instance, held that the universe was created and there were finite, which made the infinite regress of caused causes in this universe impossible. Other Muslim philosophers such as Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd distanced themselves from the Islamic theology of Kalam by rejecting the doctrine of creation from nothing, creation ex nihilo. For Ibn Rushd, I quote, the world is eternal but caused. God is eternal and uncaused, since God is God's own ground and is a necessary being, end quote. Both Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd argued that since our eternal universe contains contingent beings, it must have the necessary being as its foundation. Jewish and Christian thinkers, Moses Maimonides and Thomas Aquinas, took the middle way between the interpretations of Muslim Kalam theology and the speculations of Muslim philosophy. They sided with Muslim theologians in affirming the doctrine of creation, which is explicitly stated in the scriptures. At the same time, they supported the rationalism of Muslim philosophers with respect to the laws of nature, and in contrast to the providentialism of Al-Kindi and Al-Ghazali, who argued, I quote, that God is the only true causal agent of every event, unquote. Overall, the table that you see in this slide represents the different positions of Muslim, Christian, and Jewish thinkers with respect to the cosmological argument. The doctor of the Christian Church, St. Thomas Aquinas, is especially known for his formulations of the a posteriori arguments for God's existence. In his Summa of Theology, Aquinas wrote about the so-called five ways one could prove the existence of the Almighty. The first three of them represent various versions of the cosmological argument. 
that arrives at its conclusion based on the existence of motion or change, causation and contingency in the world. The fourth way proceeds, I quote, from the gradation to be found in things, unquote, that points to the superlative degree of existence or divine perfection, to, I quote, something which is to all beings the cause of their being, goodness and every other perfection, and this we call God, unquote. Finally, the fifth way presents the teleological argument that postulates the purposive character of the universe, which in its turn refers back to the existence of its designer. A posteriori arguments that appeal to history and divine revelation, to my knowledge, have not been sufficiently explored in the Christian tradition. Their examples can be traced in medieval Hindu speculation, more specifically in the Nyaya school of religious philosophy. Here one find, finds proofs which are based on the authority of scriptural texts and the very nature of religion and religious rituals that originate in sacred scriptures. I quote, the right knowledge caused by testimony is one which is produced by a quality in the speaker, uh, meaning his knowledge of the exact meaning of the words used. Hence, the existence of God is proved as he must be the subject of such a quality in the case of the Hindu scriptures of the Veda. Now we turn to the arguments uh, for the existence of God that were provided by Abdul Baha. As far as I know, in his writings and public addresses, Abdul Baha never mentions the a priori arguments for God's existence. Sometimes he hints at the inner perception as the source of those arguments. But even then, he does not explore this line of thought in more detail. In some answered questions, he mentions the depth of inner perception as the sign of strength and adds that the external arguments are needed for those whose spiritual understanding is limited and whose souls are weak. He says, I quote, if the inner perception be open, a hundred thousand clear proofs become visible. But for those who are deprived of the bounty of the spirit, it is necessary to establish external arguments, end quote. All of the proofs of God's existence that Abdul Baha discusses are the a posteriori arguments, which are based on our observation of the external world. Most of them involve the order and composition of natural universe and echo the five ways of St. Thomas Aquinas. In his various writings and talks, Abdul Baha formulates his own versions of the cosmological argument which Aquinas divided into three separate parts that address change, causation, and contingency of the world. Regarding change, in some answered questions, Abdul Baha notes that, I quote, the change in the outward form of the smallest thing proves the existence of a creator. Then how could this vast, boundless universe have created itself and come to exist solely through the mutual interaction of the elements." End quote. The logic of the argument is that change or motion in the world necessarily requires the existence of an entity which set the world in motion, and that is what people call God. In the tablet to Dr. Forel, Abdul Baha turns to the second part of the cosmological argument, which is related to causation. He writes, I quote, as we reflect with broad minds upon this infinite universe, we observe that motion without a motive force and an effect without a cause are both impossible. That every being has come to exist under numerous influences and continually undergoes reaction. Such process of causation goes on and to maintain that this process goes on indefinitely is manifestly absurd. Thus, such a chain of causation must of necessity lead eventually to him who is the ever-living, the all-powerful, who is self-dependent, and the ultimate cause. 
The third part of the argument that involves the existence of contingent beings as proof of the reality of the necessary being takes several forms in Abdul Baha's writings. In some answered questions, for example, he argues, I quote, so long as the contingent world is characterized by dependency, and so long as this dependency is one of its essential requirements, there must be one who in his own essence is independent of all things, end quote. In another place, Abdu'l-Bahá correlates dependency, which is essential to the entities in the contingent world, with limitations and mutual influences that follow from this notion. He points out, I quote, Although all created things grow and develop, yet are they subjected to influences from without. Thus, each one of these entities exerts its influence and it is likewise influenced in its turn. Inescapably then, the process leads to one who influences all and yet is influenced by none, thus severing the chain. And further, all created beings are limited, and this very limitation of all beings proves the reality of the limitless, for the existence of a limited being denotes the existence of a limitless one. Yet another version of the same argument in Abdul Baha's writings is related to the creation of man, the highest creature who is still a contingent being that has limited abilities and, de and depends on divine help in his intellectual and spiritual growth. Here is another quote from Abdul Baha. Among the proofs and arguments for the existence of God, he writes, is the fact that man has not created himself but rather that his creator and fashioner is another than he. And it is certain and indisputable then that the creator of man is not like man himself, because a powerless being cannot create another being, and an active creator must possess all perfections to produce his handiwork." End quote. The fourth way of St. Thomas Aquinas is based on the gradations of things and various degrees of perfection, which presuppose the necessity of the superlative degree of God. Abdul Baha makes a similar argument in some answer questions, where he says that, I quote, the contingent world is the source of deficiencies and God is the source of perfection. The very deficiencies of the contingent world testify to God's perfections. The weakness of the creature is evidence of the power of God. Without power, there could be no weakness. This weakness makes it evident that there is a power in the world, and hence the smallest thing proves the existence of a creator." End quote. In the tablet to Dr. Farrell, Abdu'l-Bahá uses the idea of limitation in the same context. I quote, limitation itself proves the existence of the unlimited, for the limited is known through the unlimited. Just as weakness itself proves the existence of wealth, darkness itself is a proof of the existence of light, for darkness is the absence of light. The fifth way of St. Thomas Aquinas is known as the teleological argument, and it states that the natural order and harmony of the universe must have the intelligent designer as their ultimate source. Abdu'l-Bahá often makes use of this argument in his speeches and writings. In the tablet to Dr. Farrell, for instance, he points out, I quote, as we observe the coming together of elements um, giving rise to the existence of beings and knowing that beings are infinite they being the effect how can the cause be finite End quote. later in his letter to dr farrell abdul baha elaborates on this point in greater detail he begins with the assumption that i quote formation is of three kinds and of three kinds only accidental necessary 
and voluntary. End quote. As for the first one, he argues, uh, and here's another quote, the coming together of various constituent elements of beings cannot be accidental, for into every effect there must be a cause. It also cannot be compulsory, for then the formation must be an inherent property of the constituent parts, and the inherent property of a thing can in no wise be disassociated from it. Thus, under such circumstances, the decomposition of any formation is impossible, for the inherent properties of a thing cannot be separated from it. Hence, only one possibility remains, namely, that of the voluntary formation, meaning an unseen force described as the ancient power causes these elements to come together, every formation giving rise to a distinct being. End quote. As Abdul Baha concludes, I quote, this infinite universe with all its grandeur and perfect order could not have come to exist by itself. As one's vision is broadened and the matter observed carefully, it will be made certain that every reality is but an essential requisite of other reality. Thus to connect and harmonize these diverse and infinite realities an all unifying power is necessary that every part of existent being may in perfect order discharge its own function." End quote. To sum up, the perfect composition of the natural world presupposes is its intelligent designer in the same way as a, I quote, piece of bread proves that it has a maker, end quote. Similarly, as Abdul Baha points out, I quote, what has been written presupposes and proves the existence of a writer. These words have not written themselves, and these letters have not come together of their own volition. And now consider this infinite universe. Is it possible that it could have been without a creator? Or that the creator and cause of this infinite words should be without intelligence? In my opinion, Abdu'l-Baha provides significantly less arguments for the existence of God regarding history and historical events than he does with respect to the nature and order of the universe. His detailed explanations of the function of prophecy belong rather to the field of philosophical anthropology, while his discussions of the evolution of religion and progressive revelation constitute an integral part of his philosophy of history. Nevertheless, one finds in Abdul Baha's writings one implicit argument from history that is supposed to deliver a definite proof of divine existence. It involves the effects, or in biblical terms, the fruits of the lives and teachings of the prophets. I quote, a cause which all the governments and peoples of the earth, notwithstanding all their powers and their armies, are unable to promote and promulgate, one holy soul promulgates without aid or assistance, Abdul Baha exclaims in some answered questions, and asks his readers, can this be accomplished through the agency of mere human power? He continues, for example, Christ alone and single-handed raised the banner of peace and amity, a feat that the combined forces of all the mighty governments of the world are unable to accomplish. The main point, he says in conclusion, is that Christ accomplished what all the kings of the earth were powerless to achieve. He united differing nations and changed ancient customs." End quote. This achievement alone, according to Abdul Baha, stands as a definite proof of the divine source of Christ's power. It also represents, I may add, the mother of all proofs that relate to history, and it can be extended to the teachings of all the prophets and founders of world religions, as well as to the influences which the sacred writings exert on people 
and to the survival of religious minorities despite severe persecutions and cruel conquests by countless empires. The least of these derivative historical proofs of the existence of God and his involvement in human affairs could really be multiplied almost infinitely. The purpose of my talk was to present in the context of global philosophy the arguments for the existence of God that are scattered throughout numerous writings and utterances of Abdu'l-Baha. From a Baha'i perspective, Abdu'l-Baha occupies a unique place in religious history, and Baha'is believe that his knowledge was inspired by the Holy Spirit. From the standpoint of comparative philosophy, we could also make the following conclusions. First, most of the arguments that Abdu'l-Baha explicitly uses are known in the history of philosophy as the so-called a posteriori proofs of the existence of God. And second, although Abdu'l-Baha never mentions St. Thomas Aquinas, most of the arguments he discusses with certain individual variations fall under the rubric of Aquinas' five ways. Since medieval Christian thought was largely influenced by classical Muslim philosophy and theology, it is possible that Abdu'l-Baha was well-versed in, in and may have drawn from the Muslim thought on the subject. Abdu'l-Baha never wrote a systematic philosophical treatise on the subject of proofs, and therefore was not obligated to analyze the historical development of the topic. In his writings and public addresses, he usually does not mention the names of individual philosophers but rather goes to the heart of the argument with the intention of strengthening the faith of his readers or listeners. Still, I think, it is worth mentioning that Abdu'l-Baha does not address modern Western thought on the subject of proofs. More specifically, the Kantian rebuttal of a priori and a posteriori arguments from his critique of pure reason and especially Kant's critique of the ontological argument, which the argument, as far as I know, Abdu'l-Baha never discusses. And that concludes my presentation on the arguments for the existence of God in Abdu'l-Baha's writings. Here is my bibliography. Thank you for listening and goodbye.